Hi there, thanks for joining us today for the third installment in our Advent sermon series. My name's Jennifer, and today we're talking specifically about the joy of Christmas. So think back with me for a moment over your lifetime to a time when you received good news. Maybe it wasn't this year, 2020 has been a pretty tough one for all of us, but if you go back a little further, can you remember a specific moment when you were given joyful good news? Most of us can probably think of a number of different occasions. Maybe a family member announced their pregnancy. Maybe you sold a house that had been on the market for a while. Maybe you got a new job. Maybe a child was accepted to college. Maybe your favorite team won the World Cup. Or maybe you aced that final exam. Maybe it was when someone that you love was declared cancer-free, or the doctor came out of an operating room to tell you that the surgery was a success. These moments stand out in our memories because for a few days or hours or minutes, nothing else matters but that good news. And the joy and relief of having a hope fulfilled is a highlight of our lives that we remember for many years to come. Proverbs 15.30 says, light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart, and good news gives health to the bones. But don't worry, we are not going back to our series on Proverbs today. That is just a little sidebar to remind you that there is still a lot of good stuff in Proverbs that we didn't get a chance to touch on in our last series. And so if you haven't finished reading the book of Proverbs yet, you really should finish. But today, we're looking at good news that the angels gave to the shepherds on the very first Christmas Eve. The story is found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2. And this good news was the best news that the world has ever received or ever will receive. This was the moment to end all moments. And it's so good that it's been repeated all around the world every Christmas for over 2,000 years. It was good news not just for the shepherds who first heard it, but it's good news for the entire human race throughout history. As Christians, we believe it is still good news, not just for the people of Israel, for everyone. And it's better news than the very best news that any of us have ever received in our lives. It's good news for everyone, from the indigenous people of Australia, to the artists in Paris, to the businessmen of Japan, and the mothers in Kenya and the factory workers in Bangladesh and even the retirees here in White Rock. This angel who made the announcement said, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Or if you'd like that in the King James Version, it says, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. News of great joy to all people everywhere for all time. So if that's true, then I want to hear this message, don't you? What is this good news of great joy? Well, it's simply this. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And that's it. That's the whole message. The angels then go on to announce to the shepherds how they're, will, they'll, how they're to recognize the baby, and they celebrate with a song of praise to God. But the good news of great joy is actually short enough that even little children can memorize it. Now, I want you to pretend for a moment like you've never heard this message before in your life. Really, just try to clear your mind of everything that you know about Jesus and about Christianity. Let's pretend that you've never read the Bible, you've never gone to church before, and you have no Christian influences in your life at all. And let's say you're standing in line at the grocery store, and the person behind you says to you, hey, did you hear the great news? Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Would that make any sense to you? You would probably be wondering, what's the town of David? And who is David? And what's this about a savior? I didn't know I needed a savior. What am I being saved from? What's a messiah? And a lord, is that like a member of the House of Lords in England? Is this British royalty or something? The message doesn't make a whole lot of sense in 21st century Canada. And many millions of people hear this one sentence at Christmas without understanding it at all. 
It's on Christmas cards. It's on ornaments, and it's in plays and nativity scenes. Anybody who's ever seen a Charlie Brown Christmas has heard this message, and maybe as Christians, maybe we've felt a little, little bit proud of that. Like in some way, Charles Schultz has successfully evangelized all of North America. But you know what? The message makes no sense anymore without an explanation of the context. Without some background information, you can't understand the message, and without understanding it, you can't experience the joy. There is incredible joy packed into this one little sentence, but it's it's not enough just to go around repeating it. We have to make it clear what this sentence meant to the shepherds who first heard it, if we want to understand what's so joyful about it. So I want you now to put yourselves in the place of the shepherds who are hearing this message from the angel. Out in a field in first-century Israel, we're going to break this sentence down and look at how each piece contributes to the joy of the message. So, what would you shepherds be understanding from the angel's words? Well, the first word is today. Today, in the city of David, a savior has been born. And for the shepherds, this means urgency. The angel says this event is happening immediately, right now, and you get to experience it. So this is not just some announcement you could read in the paper, and it wouldn't matter to your life at all. This announcement is supposed to interrupt your daily activities and demand your attention right now. It's up close and personal. It's something that is real and relevant to you and your family and your friends and your community. It's happening today. Secondly, it's happening in the town of David. Well, that's convenient because you shepherds are standing just outside the town of David in the fields, and the town of David is another name for the place where King David was born, Bethlehem, and he was born in about a thousand BC, way, way, way before the shepherds. But King David was famous as being the greatest king of Israel, and so not only is This announcement, this event, happening today here, it's happening here right now where you are. And so, as Israelite shepherds, you know the significance of the town of David, the town of David, the hometown of King David's descendants. God had made a specific promise that one of King David's descendants would rule over an eternal kingdom. The story is told in Scripture that King David had offered to build a temple, a house for God, and God replied by saying, "Actually, no. I'm the one who's going to build a house for you, meaning a royal dynasty." So this is what God said to King David through the prophet Nathan, and it's from the book of Second Samuel, chapter seven, verses eleven to sixteen. The Lord declares to you that the Lord Himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul. Whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So now, just to make it a little bit more complicated, this promise to David was actually kind of a, a double prophecy, because it was intended to be fulfilled twice. First of all, it was fulfilled through David's son, King Solomon. Who did go on to build a temple for the Lord, and who was punished by God because he turned away to worship idols alongside of his many, many wives? But by the time the angels came to the shepherds, this prophecy was understood to be something that would also be fulfilled in the future, because King David's dynasty, his kingdom, had actually ended a long time ago when the people of Israel were exiled. And now, with the current Roman occupation of Israel, there was no true king over them anymore. So anybody who was born in the town of David, as a descendant of David, could potentially be the one to fulfill this prophecy again and restore the kingdom of God to Israel. The expectation was that this king from the town of David would bring back 
the glory days of peace and righteousness and justice. The reason this is such joyful news for the shepherds is because it meant that this, the time had fully come. God had finally fulfilled this prophecy and he had kept his word. It meant God was faithful to them after all. There had been some doubt about that over the last couple hundred years when they hadn't been hearing from God. But it meant his plan was finally being fulfilled despite all evidence to the contrary. And so the joy of being alive to experience this fulfillment would be kind of like our joy if we heard that Jesus Christ was coming back in person later today. We would be so delighted, beyond thrilled, just overwhelmed at the idea that we would get to be part of the generation that would experience God's promises fulfilled and see them with our own eyes. So the shepherds are understanding that right now, right here, God's ancient promises are being fulfilled. And that is news of great joy. But there's even jo greater joy that comes in the three titles that are given to this baby. Savior, Messiah, and Lord. We know from reading the earlier chapters of Luke that the baby's name is Jesus, but the shepherds don't know that yet. They're only given these titles, and each one has a very important meaning. It's significant that this is the only instance in any of the four Gospels where these three titles are put together to describe Jesus. So we are supposed to sit up and take notice. Something very important is being communicated here. So first, Jesus is called Savior. And this is a word that had many different connotations. It's actually not a title that Jesus used very often in the Gospels. He never called himself the Savior. In that day and age, Caesar Augustus was called Savior and also Lord. So there was a political and a military sense to the word savior. A savior in that sense was supposed to deliver you from your enemies and bring peace to your city and your nation. It's likely that the shepherds were thinking in those kinds of terms. But if they had known that the baby's name was Jesus, they might have thought differently. The angel who appeared to Joseph commanded him to give Mary's son the name Jesus. And that means the Lord saves. The angel said, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then in Mary's song of praise, she calls God her savior. So the spiritual and the divine meaning of savior is what is being emphasized here. Only God can forgive our sins and he's the one who blesses us, who has mercy on us, who rescues us, and he's going to save us from our sins through this baby Jesus, who's called our Savior. This is huge and also probably very confusing to the people who knew it at the time, because the remedy for sin back then was that you would go to the temple and make a sacrifice. So how could a person, even a great man, even a king descended from King David, how could that person save you from things that you'd done wrong? What was Jesus going to do? And who was he going to be? There's a lot of mystery and anticipation in this term, savior. It didn't quite make full sense to them yet. The next phrase in the sentence is that a savior has been born to you. And I think that's very significant. Not just that a savior has been born, but specifically born to you. If the angel hadn't said that, the shepherds might have thought, well, okay, a savior has been born. For Israel, that's good. Maybe we should go tell the synagogue leader or the priest or the governor. But no, this is a personal message. The Savior is born to you as well as to all people. And that was astonishing to them. Why should God care about these lowly shepherds? Who were they to get to hear this announcement first? Part of the joy of this message is that it's not generic but it's specific and personal for every single person who hears it. It levels the playing field between all people, rich or poor, powerful or weak. A savior has been born to you, which means God cares about you individually. And so the shepherds responded then by going to see the baby Jesus for themselves. Why not? The angel said he was born for them, so they had as much right as anybody to go and visit him. So this is the first chunk of the sentence. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. But it goes on then 
to clarify that he is the Messiah. In some verses, it says he is Christ instead of Messiah. And that's fine because they both mean the same thing. They both mean the anointed one. Christ is the Greek term and Messiah is the Hebrew. And the shepherds would have known that an anointed one was a person who was chosen by God for some special leadership responsibility, whether as a priest, a prophet, or a king. And all those roles would be fulfilled in Jesus' ministry, because as a prophet, he would declare the truth about God, he would teach his commands, and he would reveal what God was planning to do in the future. And as a priest, he would be a mediator between God and man, He would make the ultimate sacrifice for sins so that people could come into God's presence without any guilt or shame. And as a king, he would rule over a kingdom, God's eternal and perfect kingdom that was promised to King David. But the word Messiah meant even more than that. It carried a whole lot of scriptural baggage with it. There's many different passages in the Old Testament that were said to describe or foretell the ministry of this coming Messiah who would restore this royal dynasty of King David. Uh, Psalm 2 and Psalm 89 are examples of messianic psalms that describe the Messiah's role as king and savior. And then the prophet Isaiah foretold many specific details about Jesus' life, especially in Isaiah chapters 9 and 11, which you can look up later. The Messiah was supposed to be filled with God's spirit and with wisdom and rule over Israel with perfect justice and righteousness. He would have a very close relationship with God, so close that several times it's mentioned that God would call him his son. The Messiah was supposed to destroy the wicked and bring about peace on earth, restoring paradise. He'd be called by these titles, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So all of this and more could have been in the minds of the shepherds as they heard the term Messiah. But unfortunately for us, there's really no word or concept in our secular culture today that can compare with what the word Messiah meant to these shepherds in the first century. Uh, Messiah meant hope. It meant nothing was ever going to be the same. It meant the end of hundreds of years of suffering. It meant the dawn of a new age. A Messiah meant God was directly intervening in history to fight on behalf of his people. A Messiah meant God cared about them and that he was keeping his promises to them. It's hard for us to comprehend the joy that's associated with this announcement of a Messiah because here in Canada, we aren't suffering the way that they did. We don't think we need a Messiah. As a whole, we aren't oppressed, we aren't poor, we aren't at war, we aren't hoping for some past glory days to be restored, but the shepherds were. So we have to put ourselves in their shoes and imagine what it would be like to be one of the poorest and most despised people in a nation full of poor and despised people who were suffering, and then be told by an angel that a Messiah was born right here, right now, for you, and that everything was about to change. The message of great joy ends by giving Jesus the title, the Lord. Now, the most important confession of faith in the early church was that Jesus is Lord. In the Bible, the word Lord has two meanings. It has the everyday meaning, and it has a divine meaning. So in common everyday language, the Greek word for Lord is kurios, and it simply meant master, or owner, or sometimes even just sir. It was a title of respect for someone who had authority over you. But Lord is also a title used for God. Jewish people were not allowed to say the personal name of God out loud. So when they were reading the Hebrew scriptures, they would substitute Adonai, or Lord, instead of God's personal name, Yahweh. And then when people translated from the Old Testament, from Hebrew into Greek, Adonai was translated as Kyrios, which is the same Greek word that's used here for Lord. So to say that Jesus is kurios can have a double meaning, both that Jesus is our master and that Jesus is Adonai. He is God. So now we get the full picture of this message. These three titles for Jesus work together to mean that God, who is sovereign over the entire universe, who has all the power and authority, who owns everything and everyone, including you and me. 
He has somehow been born as a baby to save us from sin, fulfilling his promise to establish an eternal kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace on earth. The angel couldn't give just one title to Jesus to explain who he is and why he came. He needed all three, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Or we could say our rescuer, the anointed one, our master. The message is good news of great joy. And it requires a response because if this is true, then we owe everything to Jesus. We must submit to him in worship and give him our lives in service or we're going to miss out on this new reality of what God has done. He has come to us with this incredible offer of salvation, of eternal life in his kingdom and of our lives fitting into his great master plan so that we become part of something that's so much bigger and so much more important than ourselves. To just ignore this great gift would be unthinkable. Can you imagine the shepherds saying, no thanks, we don't need a Messiah, we're good, we don't need to be saved from anything, we don't want another king like David, we'll just do our own thing. That would be ridiculous. If you really understand this message of joy, then why would you reject it? But that's what many people do today when they hear this message, because they don't understand it. They hear, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you, he is the Messiah, the Lord. But that doesn't mean anything to them because they don't understand those words and they're not aware of their own need. So somehow, we need to translate this message of joy into something that makes sense again to our family and our friends and our neighbors who don't know all this background information that I've shared with you today. So if I were to try and share this message of great joy to someone in words that are commonly used today, I would have to say something like this. Christmas is about celebrating Jesus' birth, who is with us in spirit right now and right here. Jesus came to save us from the guilt and shame of everything we've done wrong and help us reconnect with God. God promised thousands of years ago that Jesus would come and restore everything to the way it's supposed to be. Jesus is God in the flesh, and we owe him our lives. He's inviting you personally to meet him this Christmas and experience the deep joy of knowing God that only he can give. That might actually make a little sense to someone in our current culture. I hope it makes sense to you. No matter who you are, no matter what your circumstances, every human being on earth knows that things are not the way they should be in this world, either in society at large or in our own personal lives. Our souls cry out for something more, some sense of purpose, some hope that there really is someone in control of all this. And the message of Christmas is that there is. Jesus was born to you personally, and he's right here, right now, offering you salvation and the chance to be part of what he is doing in the world. All you have to do is respond in faith. Trust that Jesus is real. Trust that this message is true and then experience his presence with you by reading his story in the Bible, prayerfully considering who Jesus was and what he did. And he will open your eyes to the joy that's found in having a relationship with God. You won't find that kind of joy in anything else. No other good news in life lasts forever, but this will. So don't miss out on what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Don't miss out on this joy. Would you pray with me, please? Jesus, we are so grateful that you were born at the very first Christmas, that you brought God to us. You came down from heaven to us to live among us, to teach us, to be our prophet and our priest and our king. We don't know sometimes how to communicate the joy of this good news that when we were lost, you came and found us, that when we were sinners, you washed us clean, that you have forgiven everything and offered us grace and the opportunity to be with you in heaven forever. Lord, we want to be able to share this with people who don't know you and who don't have that kind of joy. So we pray that you would translate this message from scripture into daily life, Lord, that it would come through in all of our actions and our words, 
in the ways that we serve and give and love other people this Christmas, Lord. Please restore to us that joy of our salvation. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.